Hello, I'm Daniel Ortiz, and welcome to American Dream Latin Souls, where we share the inspiring story of Hispanic business success. Today, my guest is entrepreneur Miriam Ortiz y Pino. Miriam, welcome to our program. Hi, thanks for having me, Daniel. So, Miriam, you have a very unique business. You are the founder of More Than Organized, which is, and you are a certified professional organizer. Yes. Okay, so that's something you don't hear about every day in the context of business. But as a business coach, I understand the importance, and, and I think it's going to be a great opportunity for our audience to learn about why being organized is, is, helps you be successful in business. But before we get into your story, Miriam, tell us, what is your American dream and what does it mean to you? Uh, my American dream was to do my own thing, be able to create something of my own and share it with the world. Okay, so how long have you had that dream? Is that something you had as a little kid? I did. Okay. Um, I think it came up pretty early when I was a kid, but it got squashed a little bit for many years in between. Okay, so here, here's what I'm hearing. So you want to do your own thing as a little kid. Mm -hmm. Little kids are not supposed to do their own thing. They're supposed to behave you know, do their homework, be good little boys and girls. Right. And entrepreneurs, you know, there's a reason why a lot of successful entrepreneurs were C students. <laughs> and I was not a C student. You know, no, I'm going to say you were. <laughs> but a lot of, you know, because you know, we want to do our own things, that we're independent. Right. So uh, tell us more about what does that look like as far as doing your own thing. Um, you know, as a kid, I, I didn't play all the typical games. I was always in charge of stuff. So I created a school and a little summer camp for the kids in my neighborhood. I played detective agency and okay. um, <laughs> restaurant instead of house. You know, there was lots of little clues along the way that I didn't line up till much later. Okay. Well, there's a pattern with entrepreneurs. I always say that entrepreneurs are born and not made. It's a mindset. Mm -hmm. And the, the pattern starts off early. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs are start off, you know, uh, selling lemonade, lemonade stands. Right. You know, I've sold paper airplanes and cut weeds and, you know, always making money doing something or starting something new. So mm -hmm. now that we've established that you are two natural born entrepreneurs, tell us about what it is that you do. So what is more than organized? Right. So I help people, especially entrepreneurs and other creative visionaries, create the systems and routines so that they can do their best work practically effortlessly. Okay, what does that look like? So I go in and work on their clutter, okay. and then I look at their workflow, and we match it all up so that their environment, whether it's their office or their home or both, contribute to their success as a business owner. All right, now as a business coach, I, I get what you do, because mm -hmm. I understand the importance of being organized, especially in, in this modern world that we live in, a lot of business people actually work from home. Yes. Right. And I always knew this, and I, growing up, you know, we, uh, in, in being in sports and being involved in athletics, our coaches used to always say something that was very, very important. It lives with me to this day. If you want to win on the field, you have to win off the field. Right. And in business, if, you, if you're not organized, if you, if you're cl you have clutter everywhere, you're not going to be mm -hmm. as productive and successful as you can be. So it's kind of un the untold story. One of the untold stories of success in business is mm -hmm. having your act together, right? <laughs> right, and it, it's interesting. Um, I've just been noticing this a lot lately myself, but a lot of productivity um, coaches and, and people in the online space often mention, you know, you have to do the three things a day. You have to focus on the three things. Which but are? they fail to tell whatever your three oh, important things are mm -hmm. each day. But they fail to mention that they already have the systems and routines that take care of all the other little stuff in place when they're picking those three things. So a lot of people end up picking, you know, well, I got to do my laundry, I got to pick up my kids, and then I can work on my business. And it's right. like, no, you have that stuff in place so that the three things are all towards your business. Right. And a lot of the emphasis is on goals, you know, setting your mm -hmm. goals, setting your business plan and your marketing plan. Right. And that is important. Mm -hmm. But underneath all that, right, is... Yeah how organized are you in your life exactly and what's reflective of that is what does your your house look like what does your office look like mm -hmm. what does your car look like i can always tell when you walk into a person's home or a person's office what their outer world looks like is a reflection of their inner world yeah the environment you work in is a reflection of what you can accomplish in the world okay. and how you do one thing is how you do everything okay yeah and it's attention mm -hmm. to detail right it comes down to it yeah, but without getting caught up in the detail. Okay. I mean, it can go both ways. There's a whole continuum along the organizing scale. Okay, so how do you approach the business aspect of this? I look at the five essential business systems that every business has to have. Okay, so I'm, I'm a potential client. 
mm -hmm. and pitch me as to what you would do for me. What, what would you do for me, Miriam? How, how would, are you going to help me be more successful in my business? Right. So we take a look and see if you have those five essential systems set up and to what extent they're set up. Okay, five essential sim systems. Yeah, being there's money, marketing, people, inventory, and deliverables. Okay. So there's a lot of different ways of looking at it, but I found every business I've ever worked with has those five, and okay. we can simplify it by and not get overwhelmed by using just those five. Ah, uh, you said the magic word. Overwhelm. Overwhelm. <laughs> you know, yeah. in, in the business world, it's commonly, it's a misconception that the, the biggest challenge entrepreneurs have, and it is a challenge, but it's not the biggest challenge, is, is money and finances. No. The biggest challenge, you're right, you're right. The biggest challenge that entrepreneurs have is isolation, frustration, and overwhelm. Right. Right. And because we're entrepreneurs and we want to do things our own way, we tend to resist any kind of structure. Mm -hmm. So sure. that contributes to the overwhelm. Right. So as soon as I... So you really solve overwhelm and you help people be I do. more productive by, or, or by taking care of that overwhelm and getting systems. And that's the key word is systems. Right. Because uh, eventually to be a successful entrepreneur, you can't be just you know, chasing rabbits all over the place or chasing the shiny object. You create systems. It's that do the work for you, and then things start to flow, right? Exactly. I mean, we're talking about intangible stuff, but you know, I want our audience to know that as an entrepreneur, it's, this is really what it's about, the inner game stuff of, of flow and systems. Right. So an example would be if you can't find your keyboard because it's buried under the files you dumped on your desk last night, you can't answer your emails. Uh -huh. You know, it can come down to very simple things like that. Right. Okay. And you probably already have some systems in place, you just didn't know they were systems. Okay, so we're looking at an office here. What does this tell you? Walk into this situation. This is a, obviously somebody who works from home. Right. As a lot of us do now. I mean, my, I work from home most of the time. Yeah. This is a friend of mine who does, um, and a client that does podcasting and um, works with a lot of nonprofits to set up trainings and um, programs. So okay, now this kind of looks kind of clean to me. I mean, you can see uh, the top of the desk. So mm -hmm. what are you seeing when you see this? So that is an, um, a medium shot. That is, we had worked once already and cleared her desk of the major piles. So mm -hmm. this is about two oh, weeks so this is later. before and after. Right. Shot. Okay. Well, it's kind of. In between. Um, this was uh, the midpoint. So we created a flow. So the inbox there in the middle of the desk is where everything she needs to work on is. Mm -hmm. um, the stuff is hasn't been all the way formalized in terms of what the system is, but she knows to put everything that she's working on in that one place. Okay. And all the podcast equipment is across the room in the background there. Um, and the desk is fairly clear. That space in front of the keyboard, that's for her arms. <laughs> um, and she can see the screen and there's nothing on the chair. Okay. So it's, you know, there's still a little bit of work to do in terms of the systems. But the first thing we do is clear the decks. You've got to have a clean slate to work off of. Okay. All right. And that's what it looked like at the end of the second session. Okay. And in the background, you... See more, see, I, I, I just look at how much of the desktop can you see. So you can see more desktop. Right. We moved the pencil cup to the right of the desk because she is right-handed. Mm -hmm. um, and all the... And there's enough space to move the microphone over when she's doing a podcast and the mixer can stay in that back area. Mm -hmm. There's, um, in the background is where all the um, supplies are. Mm -hmm. And the post-it notes on that file cabinet are so she knows where the file categories so are until she learns them. Everything in its place is what I'm Exactly. Hearing. Okay. We defined the spaces. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. So what, what are the effects of that? I mean, do you, what do people tell you after they've gone through your, this process? Now, you actually go into people's homes and in their offices. Yes. In their personal space. Yes, both. Okay. And I work virtually, too, so we can do it over the phone. Okay. But uh, the biggest aha my clients get is that they're not overwhelmed anymore. Oh, and okay. they know where things are. So knowing where things are and what you're going to do with them takes all that worry out of the back of your head. Mm -hmm. An enormous amount of energy is spent wondering, and even if it doesn't seem that important to know that your pens are in the third drawer on the right, knowing that, you don't have to go, where are my pens three I, or I four times a times day. I I've asked, you know, where's a pen, where's a pen, I need a pen, where's... Right. Right, you know, you're talking <laughs> on the phone with somebody and they want to give you some information. 
and you're fumbling around, where's, you know, where's my pen, you know? Right. If they're in a cup right there on your desk Say, no, or okay. in the drawer or, you know, wherever you're comfortable with the pen, you're much more likely to know where your pen is. Also, if you only have one pen, you're much more likely to treat it as precious and only have and always know where it is. So is that something you recommend? People just have one I pen? I do. <laughs> <laughs> I've had the same pen since I graduated college. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Right. It's I possible. Know I, when I graduated, I got some <laughs> nice pen pencil set, you know, the gold mm -hmm. thing that's again, I don't even know where that is. It's in right. storage or something. Because you had a whole lot of pens with other people's advertising. Probably, yeah. yeah. And you want to save those because they're kind of special, you know? Yeah. You know, so. okay. I like to use special every day. Okay. <laughs> so how, how do you approach a business? How do you get clients? Um, lots of marketing mm -hmm. and outreach and conversations. It's, okay, um, we'll define that. What, is that. what does lots of marketing look like? What's your primary? I do lots of email marketing. Mm -hmm. I have my website. Um, I have a blog. Okay, what, what is your website address? Morethanorganized.net. Well, that's easy enough to remember. Morethanorganized.net. Yes. Okay. Um, I visited your website. Yeah. Actually, you, you have some video on there. Mm -hmm. You do offer a free... I forget what it is, an organizer set or something that people There's can download? There's a one-minute mail solution kit. One mail solution kit, okay. Tell and us about that. And it is an e-course on how to organize the papers. So it will work for your home, the mail that comes in. It will work for some business papers, most of the business papers. Um, and it works for the email and computer files, too. It's the same concept, just digital format versus paper. But it's the number one thing people come to me for is... I have so many papers, I have so much information, I don't know where to put it all or what to do with it. I don't know what to get rid of. So that, that free course solves all of that. Okay, so you do offer a free course on doing that. And, you yeah. know, I, I, I know that in my own, my personal business, I don't do a lot with paper. I try to do everything paperless, mm -hmm. which I've succeeded to a large extent. Right. But I have, I, I know as of yesterday, 247 or 48 unopened emails. Mm -hmm. And that's my biggest challenge as far as overwhelmed. Because, right. And I try and, and not subscribe to so many things anymore. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, you know, important. But so how, how do you get somebody to organize just their emails? Um, I do a very simple thing. I don't actually believe in Inbox Zero. Inbox Zero is this whole thing that people are all talking about. And I don't Which means what? It, not getting your inbox all the way to zero okay. every day. I don't think it's totally possible. Mm -hmm. But I try to keep mine under 40. Um, and most of the time under 25. And to do that, you have to be ruthless with the unsubscribe. I, I sometimes want people's information, right. so I subscribe, so I, yeah. but I immediately unsubscribe once I have the thing that I was interested in. Right. Um, I have folders set up for the things I do routinely and the people I check in with routinely. And I have, I think, like 50 folders, so I'm... You might be pushing the edge of the folders. I think 50 is probably the top edge of being being effective with it. Or well, some people kind of like hoarders. You know, we, there's even a TV series on mm -hmm. hoarding. I mean, that's people that really have psychological issues right. with their with their home. But uh, is there an equivalent of hoarding? Uh, and I just thought, geez, maybe I'm an email hoarder, you know, because mm -hmm. I like information. A and couple. I always think in the back of my head, well, I might use this. Sometime about useful and, you know, usually I never even open it again. I mean, is there, is there an aspect of that? <laughs> yes. Um, it's, it all comes down to decisions, inability uh -huh. to make decisions or good decisions about the information. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a pretty complicated scenario, but right. basically, do you know what you're going to do with that email or what the next step for that email is? Mm -hmm. And can you move it forward mm -hmm. in the process? What about you just put it into a folder? And forget about mm -hmm. it. It's not as big a deal in the digital universe because there's room. Right. If your computer fills up, though, you might want to revisit that. Yeah. But when you're you have a backlog and you want to clear it out quickly, just make a folder that says before whatever the date was two weeks ago. Hmm. Pull all the sort your emails by date. Mm -hmm. Pull all the emails older than that into that folder, and you never have to look at them again. But they're there in case right. something. And I realize happens. a lot of people watching this program here that, that don't have a digital business or virtual business, this is probably mm -hmm. not a big issue for them. But um, they might have four years worth of paperwork stuffed in the corner of their office right, and it's right. the same thing. Yeah. I know people who save their, their paid bills, mm -hmm. you know, they, their whatever utility bill, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, why are you saving that? You know, they have a folder. It's like, there's years of, you know, in case I need, they think that I'm going to need that information. Well, I mean, you can get the information from mm -hmm. the phone company because they save them digitally. So, you know, I think we all have now these little things that we save, you know, this little 
hoarding aspects to our personality. Right, and some people set up a system when they first learn to pay their bills, and that system still works, and uh -huh. so there's no need to change it. But you might want to cut off the archive at seven years, right, just so right. you don't overfill the house with paper that will catch on fire right. and take everything else out yeah. with it. I think it's easier for people who are younger who grew up in the digital age, because oh, yeah. we're used to having information digital. Mm -hmm. There's an older generation, you know, that if it's not on paper, it's, it's not real. Right. Right, so they do need their files and their cabinets and... I have three clients right now that print out every single email. All the oh pages of the email, so you get, you know, seven or eight pages for They don't trust the email. servers to, to save it or...? No, they think it's different to read it on the computer than on yeah. the paper, which only till you get used to it. Okay, <laughs> all right. So we talked about but the business aspect, and I want to come back to that, but I want to mm -hmm. talk about your, your personal background and your journey okay. as an entrepreneur. Right. So your last name is Ortiz -y Pino. Yes. And uh, my last name is Ortiz, so I'm sure we're cousins somewhere back. But I think Ortiz -y Pino is a, a unique last name to northern New Mexico, where, where you come from. So what's yes. your family background? Um, ranching, sheep ranching. Mm -hmm. But you come from a Spanish family? Hispanic? Yes. Spanish from, you know, Coronado days. Okay, for, see, a lot of audience doesn't know what that means. I know. Okay, so part of my family came over before the Pueblo Revolt and part came but over just after. But say somebody from California or New York who doesn't know about the Pueblo Revolt. Tell I don't us know. About what year was that? 1590? Okay, 14, so you're part of the old original Hispanic Spanish who came to yeah. New, the northern One New Mexico. One of the founding families. In the 1500s. Founding families of, of northern New Mexico. Yes. Okay. Galisteo, Santa Fe. Okay. Las Vegas. All right, and so your family was in, in ranching. Yes. Right. And you probably had a, a land grant uh, yes. in your family. A lot of our families did. Mm -hmm. So that's where the ranching comes from. Exactly. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, so what did your journey as an entrepreneur begin? Um, 15 years ago. Okay. Uh, is when I, f or 16 years ago is when I finally decided, okay, I'm moving home from San Francisco because I'd gone there for So what was your years. vocation then before this? Before this, Before I didn't really have one. I, I mean, I, I went to University of New Mexico and I have a degree in popular culture and I had studied marketing, thought I wanted to be in advertising. Mm -hmm. Ended up hating that, the whole corporate culture and working more than eight hours a day and a lot of that overstructure for no purpose, I didn't like, <laughs> I didn't fit in good. Yeah, entrepreneurs, <laughs> we, you know, I would say that um, a job, especially corporate America, a job is, what entrepreneurs get when they're in between projects or when they're trying to figure out mm -hmm. what they want to be when they grow up, so it's a nice place, but we don't fit there. No. Uh, I've worked for corporate America, and uh, yeah, it's different. It's kind of stifling you it know, can in a lot be. of ways. Yeah, I mean, there's some structure there, and then, you know, it takes a lot of people to make the world go round, so it's nothing against corporate culture, but right. uh, if you're independent, like you mm -hmm. obviously were since a little kid, and you like to do your own thing, it's not the best fit. No, um, and I, I worked a couple different corporate jobs. I mean, I worked in an ad agency, really didn't fit in there. Um, I worked uh, for a large retail houseware store, fit in a little better there because I had a manager that really understood that I was an independent worker and mm -hmm. so created three different jobs within the company where I was my own boss yeah. or my own department. Mm -hmm. So it gave me a little bit of both um, and it gave me a great background in working with other people, learning systems and procedures and how that works to move the business forward. That's one thing that corporate America is very good is, is, yeah. is the systems. Lots of training mm -hmm. and I got to train other people so I got to practice a lot of that. Right, right. And they hire a lot of consultants to show them the systems because the, mm -hmm. the, the people in that corporate environment are not creative so they don't come up with these. They learn them from consultants. Like right. They and, buy you know. the modules of training yes. from other places. Yeah. So, so, it, so that it helped was you a nice in, your, in your career then as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, and then when I came home for Christmas one year and I realized, oh, it's time to go back to New Mexico. So I spent the next year starting my business. Okay. Doing all the research, going through the small business administration checklist, having all my ducks in a row. So when I moved back, I literally moved into my apartment and the next day I went down to City Hall and got my license. Mm -hmm. And sent a letter to everybody I knew in my parents' address books uh -huh. in my address book from college and said I'm back this is what I'm doing uh -huh. hire me <laughs> <laughs> okay. and how did that work out for you um pretty good although I did make the mistake early on of being the technician in my business so I was a professional organizer 
I organize people. I didn't really think of myself as a business owner who was a professional organizer. Mm -hmm. It took about six years for me to realize the difference. Now, you're referring to the technician and the e-myth yes. books? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I, I just want to share that because a lot of our audience doesn't know the, the lingo that we're talking about. But there's yeah. three basic types of, of people who go into business. Um, and Michael or Gerber, I believe his name was. Michael Gerber, e-myth revisited the is e the book. Says there's, there's three types. There's the manager, mm -hmm. there's the technician, mm -hmm. and then there's a true entrepreneur. Right. right, and I was somewhere in between technician and entrepreneur. Okay, and technician is just for our audience. Uh, what does a technician do type it's, of it, personality? Yeah, they know the thing they do well and how to teach it to someone else. Although sometimes they don't know how to teach it very well. They know the they thing. They know the thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the invention so it's or whatever like it is. A doctor knows how to doctor, but he doesn't know how to run a practice. Right. Or me, I'm an organizer, I can clean out your closet, but I didn't necessarily know how to get the clients to clean out the closet right. or to teach them um, as well as I could in the early days. Yeah. And, and it comes down to marketing. I mean, ultimately, whatever marketing. business is in, doesn't matter if you're a Fortune 100 company mm -hmm. um, or the person you know, working out of their, their closet or their spare bedroom, if you don't know how to market and, and share what you do in a way that people get it, understand it, then you're gonna have a hard time. 80% of all business is marketing. Yeah, at least. Um, and and many people don't get that, and they don't want to toot their own horn. And if you're an entrepreneur, especially a solopreneur, you have to be okay tooting your own horn. Okay, so you you brought up an interesting point, and how does being a woman affect that? Because women, I hear, <gasps> have a more difficult time. You know, there there be a female Donald Trump, right? <laughs> Just <Somewhere>. personality-wise. <laughs> well, uh, you know, but women, they, they say they tend to be more mm -hmm. subdued and not toot their own horn. So how has that affected you? Now, how um, do you approach as a woman? I never really had that problem, but people react differently to me because I don't have that problem. Okay. <laughs> so um, I, I think maybe right out of college I might have had that problem a little bit. Mm -hmm. But by the time I left corporate work and, and started my own thing, I have no problem with the fact that I'm a really good um entrepreneur now, mm -hmm. but I'm an excellent uh, professional organizer. I know what I'm doing. I know my stuff inside out, backwards, upside down. I, I have no trouble with that. Okay. <laughs> but many of my colleagues are like, oh, I couldn't possibly send a newsletter. I don't have anything to say. I couldn't possibly go on a TV show and talk about what I do. I'm not that good yet. There's always this support role Mm -hmm. And, oh, I do it for friends. I do it because I want to help. There's not that. I do it for money and to make the world a better place scenario that, that works for a lot of women. Okay. I think we had some photos of, um, we looked at some office photos, but here's some home photos. Now. So yeah. this is a closet that I've seen too many times in too many places. And I'm kind of a neat guy. I, I learned mm -hmm. how to do this stuff, you know, in high school from my football coaches, actually. Right. Uh, so what's this? here <laughs> so this is a typical closet of my clients they uh -huh. just they have a couple hanging rods they throw the clothes on the hangers now, they is that a woman's hang closet that's a woman's closet okay, i'm going to ask you a question that i think only a woman can answer mm -hmm. uh in, in your experience who are mess here men or women totally depends totally depends on it's equally divided okay um well, ten, i know you want to no, say no, <laughs> men tend to be thought of as messy and, and slobs and you know of course there are but oh. I've seen some women's homes and automobiles and I think whoa yeah it totally depends on the situation okay, so it's not a and gender thing no and it's not uncommon for the spouse to call me and say my <laughs> husband or my wife is a mess can you fix them yeah. and it's like no I can fix you and your reaction to their mess and uh -huh. they'll get on board when they see the difference right but I can't fix someone who doesn't want to be fixed. Okay. So there's that. Okay. So and at is, a certain point, a, people uh, just let it go. <laughs> this is a before and after? Or That's what a before and after. Okay. The same closet. Well, so it's the same closet. Okay. On wow. the left, you can see they tried. There's some bins. Right. There were some clothes on the shelf, but they had stopped folding. They ran out of room for shoes, so okay. they just started dumping on the floor. Uh -huh. At some point, the gym bag made so it out of the, the closet. this is the same quantity of clothing in the same closet? No, we got rid of about a don't third. Get it in. Okay. Um, but that's what happens. People keep putting clothes in and they don't take any old ones out. Right, right. And so that is set up so 
like things are together. So all the shirts are together, all the jackets and sweaters are together, all the skirts and pants are together. Well, just thinking, waking up in the morning, going through your daily routine, how much time do you save? You walk into your closet, you know where everything's at, you pull out your clothes, and then you start your day versus, okay, where's this and where's that? Oh, it easily and saves 10 to 15 minutes a day. Yeah, and multiply that times, you know, 30 days a, a month and, you know. Yeah, I'm really bad at math in my head, but it's a <laughs> lot of time by the end of the yeah, year. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Organizing your whole house can save you up to six weeks a year. Wow. Yeah. Just okay. by setting it up right. Yeah, I, I can see that. Yeah, I mean, the multiplier effect. And we haven't even gotten to the automobiles yet. No. Right? Yeah. You know, a car is not a giant purse or briefcase. It is a transportation device. But how much time do we spend in our, our uh, vehicles, right? Yeah. Some some of you commuting. more than I do because right. I work from home. Well, I me mean as well. But I mean, people in big <laughs> cities yeah, yeah. You know, do a lot of commuting. Lots of commuting. Yeah. And we talked about a, a program in the coaching system called um, Tolerations and, and mm -hmm. Clean Sweep. And tell us about what, what that assessment does. So it helps you Just identify. Just give our audience an example of you know, how this can work for them. Yeah, it's, it's a tool that helps you identify just what is bugging you every day on that low level that you don't think of. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just wrote a blog post about this too. It went live last night, right. which is funny. I forgot that you had sent me a copy of that tool, but mm -hmm. it's, it's little things like, is there a light bulb that needs changing? Does the car need to be washed? When was the last time you cleaned out your you closet? Have a windshield, uh, Right, some yeah. of those things that are just minor, little, everyday annoyances that by the end of the week can make you crazy. Yeah. Every week, week in, week out, and you haven't dealt with them because they're not important. Right, and but at the same time, your your mind is it's part of your mind is is devoting energy to those things. Oh yeah. Right? You haven't changed the oil in your car. You know you got to change the oil, uh, but you put it aside. You think it's not important, but there's a part of that energy that mm -hmm. could be t uh, utilizing your work or your creativity, mm -hmm. but it's focused on those things, right? Yeah, just last week, I realized I hadn't washed my car in like four months. Right, right. <laughs> We're in New Mexico. We don't wash our cars a lot because right, right. it takes about five minutes for the dust to resettle. <laughs> right. But um, it had been on my mind. Like, I'm supposed to keep my car a little bit clean. The mechanic actually said that it gets a little gunk in the oil. I should take care of that. Right. And it was a couple weeks before I got around to, to finally washing the car. And it was like, oh, what a relief. You feel better, right? It took five minutes, you know? Yeah. It's like <laughs> yeah, but you feel much, so much better. Oh, yeah. Right. And, and this is it was an interruption every day until I did it. Right. Yeah. And this is what I want our audience to, to get. And when you start taking care of these things, these tolerations and getting your, everything organized, is that your energy level increases. Oh, imme right? immediately. Yeah. It's a relief. It changes everything. It opens pathways for mm -hmm. new stuff to flow in. Uh, it's quite amazing. Yeah, it's your the energy fastest level and, way. and your peace of mind, mm -hmm. right? And you can focus more on the task at hand, your business, your marketing, you know. Yeah. And it's clarity. It's clarifying. Yeah. Um, yeah. It solves all kinds of problems. Your subconscious can go to work on all yes. those things you weren't quite sure what to do with because you're not worried about that stuff. Because part of that mind isn't going stuff. to that thing, yeah. 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 And as we practice making those little decisions, you get better at making the bigger decisions. So for entrepreneurs especially, it's important to take care of those little decisions as they come yes. up. Yes, and it's, it's a momentum effect. Yeah, it doesn't even matter if the decision is the right one because we all have to fail forward. Right, right. And being an entrepreneur, you know, it's yeah. all about the recovery, not but, about the fact that we fail. But to make less mistakes because you have more clarity. Exactly. Right. It's all it's a self-fulfilling yeah. prophecy. Sort of thing. the unknown secrets of success. And yeah. I'm, I'm really glad that you're um, part of that and, and uh, helping entrepreneurs because we truly need that. Yeah. That help. So we got about a minute left. Um, it's went by really fast, as the good interviews always do. Time flies. <laughs> <laughs> so, Miriam, my last question we ask all our guests is, what advice would you give to anybody, an entrepreneur, maybe a Latina entrepreneur who wants to get in business, maybe is mm -hmm. in the corporate world but not, knows that's not for them? What advice would you give? I would say trust yourself. Don't listen to a lot of the naysayers and people that say that you can't do it. Always trust yourself and surround yourself with people that believe in you and want to help you move forward. Right. And they're out yeah. there. Yeah. They're out there. You, you sometimes have to hunt around a lot, yeah. but you can find them. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, good advice. And thank you for sharing your story. Very inspiring. And Thanks for thank having me. the work me. you do. It's very important, and I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. Oh, good. Thank you. All right. And I'd like to thank our audience for joining us on this edition of American Dream Latin Souls. Be sure to visit us online at latinosuccess.com.